today we're going to um, continue talking about biological processes. And what we're going to do today is talk more about the organization of the central nervous system and how um, different areas of your brain control different, different types of behaviors. Okay, so we'll start here by talking about just a, a brief overview of the basic organization of your central nervous system. So we talked about on Monday that your central nervous system is composed of your brain and your spinal cord. And with your brain, within your brain, you have your cerebral cortex and your cerebellum. Okay. We talked about how the brain communicates within itself, and today what we're going to do is add in a little bit of the peripheral nervous system and how that information goes from the brain to the periphery to induce behaviors or affect behaviors. Okay. So basic organization, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system provides the output for different muscles and glands to react in terms of behavior. Okay. So we can further break this down. We have our central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, just like we, we just said. We also have our peripheral nervous system, which can be further broken down into our somatic system and our autonomic system. So our somatic system, you can think about that, you know, think soma, like we talked about with the neuron, that's the cell body. Okay, so this is a body system, the somatic system. And then we have the autonomic system, which is really involved in automatic processes. Okay. Um, we can further break that down into your sympathetic system and your parasympathetic system. And these systems are really involved in um, functions like fight or flight. Okay. You've all heard of fight or flight. When you're faced with a danger, we have to, our body has to prepare to fight that danger or to get the heck out of there. Okay. So looking more, more closely at this um, autonomic nervous system, and this is just a brief overview of all of the a lot of the systems that are affected when we're, we're faced with a fight or flight situation. So imagine that you're faced with a danger. You're walking into class and, and a bear runs at you. This is a bear example here. Um, all kinds of things happen to your body automatically. Okay? And this is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. And all of these things happen so you can either prepare to fight that bear and, and you know, save, imagine it's a bear that, that is actually interested in attacking you. Um, so you need to be able to fight that bear, or you need to be able to get out of there, okay? So different things happen with your eyes, for example. Your pupils, pupils will dilate. Um, your salivary glands are activated to in inhibit salivation. Um, your lungs, your uh, bronchi are dilated, so you can increase respiration. Your heart rate increases. Um, you stop digesting food. Because if you're in a fight or flight situation, your life is at risk. There's no point in putting energy to your stomach to start di or to, to digest your food, right? Um, and other things happen as well. So we have um, in your adrenal glands, we're going to talk about your adrenal glands a little bit later. They release adrenaline, which help you, um, help you activate your muscles. Um, we also have contraction of blood vessels. Your bladder's relaxed. So... Um, you don't have any um, issues with, with uh, processing urine and that sort of thing. And then um, once that threat is over, the parasympathetic system comes into play and everything relaxes and goes back to normal. Okay, so your pupils contract, you can salivate, um, your heart rate slows, that sort of thing. Okay, so once the danger is out of the way, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and and everything goes back to normal. So the important point, though, is that all of these things are automatic, right? If you had to think about, oh my god, there's a bear there, I better dilate my pupils and stop digesting my food so I can get away, that wouldn't be very advantageous, right? So all these are, are mediated by your autonomic nervous system. Okay. All right, so I started with some true-false questions on Monday. So fear can give you indigestion. How many of you think that's true? Right, so what's happening when you're scared, right, it's true. Um, what's happening is that when you're scared, you have activation of this autonomic nervous system, and it, in, it um, prevents digestion, okay, so, and it can cause indigestion. Okay. Chronic fear and chronic stress are, are related to um, a lot of stomach problems and ulcers and that sort of thing as well. All right. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, basic divisions of the brain. We're going to start by breaking it into three areas, and what I'm going to do is give you kind of the broad function of each of those areas. And then we're going to go talk a little bit more specifically about where things like feeding, um, emotions, and that those sorts of uh, processes are regulated. Okay, So the, the simplest breakdown is to divide the brain into three regions. We have the forebrain, which is here in the gray. We have the midbrain here in the, the orangish color. And then the hindbrain back here, which includes the cerebellum and the brainstem. Okay? 
And we'll walk through each of these and, like I said, give you general function for each. Don't worry about the substructures right now. We'll come back to the ones that, that I want you to focus on in just a minute. Okay. So your forebrain, the general structure is that you have a left and a right hemisphere. Okay. So it's as if you have two brains, right, and they are divided in the middle and connected by what's called the corpus callosum. Okay. So we have a left and a right hemisphere. In general, what we can think about is the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body, and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. And again, they're connected by, by a number of fibers called the corpus callosum. Okay, so the, the left brain can talk to the right brain, and they can provide information back and forth. Okay. Um, in the forebrain, um, what we think about as the main function of that is, is higher function, okay? So higher mental functioning. So things like planning, um, things like setting your alarm at night before you have class in the morning so you can get up, um, paying your bills, not spending all your money right away when you get it, all of those sorts of things are mediated by the forebrain, okay? So for you be, to be able to plan and to look ahead and, and to process um, information, you need to have a, um, an intact forebrain, okay? So the substructures that we'll, we'll put in the forebrain to talk about are the cerebral cortex, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about the cortex in a minute. The thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the limbic system. So these are the four areas that, that I'd like to focus on. Um, the, the forebrain is full of different nuclei that, that mediate different behaviors and are responsible for different things, but these are the ones that we'll focus on for the purposes of this, this class. Okay, so in the cerebral cortex, and um, we have gray matter and white matter, okay? I know this is, is brown matter and gray matter on the, the slide, but in reality, what you see, if you've ever seen a brain, um, what we have is gray matter here on the outside and white matter on the inside, okay? So what, the reason that this is white on the inside is because it's typically made up of myelinated axons. Okay, remember we talked about myelination in the nervous system and how the myelin wraps around the axon to speed up the conduction of the electrical signal. And so myelin is white, and what we see here is mostly myelinated neurons in that white matter. So the cortical neurons, the, the ones on the outside that make up the gray matter, are unmyelinated, okay, and that's why it appears to be gray. Okay. So important features of the uh, cerebral cortex is that it, it's highly convoluted. Right? If you flattened it out, it'd be much bigger, but it's compacted into a, a fairly small space. Okay? And we have two, um, two features that help us identify. We can use them as landmarks to figure out where different nuclei and different structures are located. We have um, a gy the gyrus, and that is a ridge. And then the grooves, are it's called a sulcus. Okay, so we can use the different sulci and the different gyri to figure out where in the brain certain things are located and then use those to our advantage when we're doing, specifically when we're doing research. Okay. All right, so further breaking down um, the brain, we can break down into four different lobes based on function. Okay, so here we have, and this should be in your slides, we have the frontal lobe, which is involved in planning your working memory is mediated in your frontal lobe. We have your parietal lobe, which mediates body sensations, so information that comes in, that sensory cortex that we talked about on Monday um, is, is mediated by um, your parietal lobe. Your occipital lobe is in the back, so back here you have your occipital lobe, and this is where vision, primary visual cortex is. So information that comes into your eyes passes all the way back to your brain before the, the message is translated. And I believe when you do the, the chapter on sensation and perception, you'll talk more about what that message is and how that gets translated into, into an image that we can recognize and put a name on. Okay? And then here we have the temporal lobe, which is largely responsible for things like hearing. Okay. So the different lobes have different function. And what I'd like to point out to you is how we can use the... Um, the gyrus and the sulcus to identify different areas. So we have two really interesting areas here. We have um, what's called the, the motor cortex, and this is in the frontal lobe. And then just behind it, we have the somatosensory cortex. And what we know is that all of your body is represented on the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. 
So everything that you feel, every time you have a peripheral stimulus, that maps on to a specific place on your sensory cortex. So your feet map on, your legs map on, your fingers, your, your nose, your mouth. And I'll show you a picture in a minute of what that actually looks like. We also have a motor cortex for which your whole body maps on to. Okay? Um, so if you were to electrically stimulate a certain part of your motor cortex, you would say it would feel like someone had touched your arm or your leg or whatever part of that cortex had been stimulated. Okay. Um, so here, here's what we have. Studies have, um, early studies were done in dogs in uh, electrically stimulating the motor cortex. So they would go in and stimulate different parts of this motor cortex. And they would look at what area, what part of the dog moved. Okay? Um, other studies, more recent studies, have been done in primates and um, have, have demonstrated the um, areas of the somatosensory cortex that are, are um, mediated and how that maps on to the somatosensory cortex. So what you see is you have different levels of representation on different parts of your body. So interestingly, you have a large part of your somatosensory cortex dedicated to your face a very small amount of your somatosensory cortex dedicated to your abdomen, for example. Um, about the same amount of space is dedicated to your face as is dedicated to your trunk. Okay. Why do you think that might be? Does anyone have an idea of why, why, it's more, why is it more important for my face to be more sensitive than, than having someone touch your trunk? So if you think about it in protective terms or in evolutionary terms, if your eyes or face or your mouth is in danger, you're going to have a lot more um, potential consequences than if you know, there's something uncomfortable or unpleasant touching your torso. Okay, so we have more important, more delicate areas of our brain or of our body represented in larger proportion on our brain. Similarly, if you look at um, the motor representation of how much is dedicated to your hands, versus how much is dedicated to your feet. Does that explain anything to you? I'm going to guess that you're probably better at typing with your fingers than typing with your toes, right? So we have much better control over our fingers and our hands based on this motor, um, the distribution of cortex that is allocated for controlling those, those movements. Okay. So this question here, if a surgeon were to stimulate a certain part of your brain electrically, you might swear that someone had struck your leg. Obviously, that's true. Right? Okay. Um, interestingly, a lot of studies, and if you're, you're interested in how um, the somatosensory cortex or motor cortex works, there have been a lot of studies looking at things like phantom limb pain. And it's thought that much of phantom limb pain is, is, um, is explained by the cortex. So with phantom limb pain, for example, someone might have their arm amputated, but they'll still feel excruciating pain or feel stimuli to that missing limb. And it's thought that what happens is your somatosensory cortex, it doesn't know that your, brain, that your arm isn't there anymore. So for example, if I were to stimulate your trunk, so you could rub somebody on the side who was missing their arm, they might swear that their arm had been stimulated because the part of the cortex that was dedicated to arm is right next to the part of cortex that's dedicated to trunk. Okay, so the brain kind of fills in in the holes, and there's no body there, but um, other stimuli can act like they were from a different part of your body. Okay. All right. So the we have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, and there's somewhat of a specialization for your hemispheres. Okay. So in general, for most people, not for everyone. The right hemisphere is dedicated to things like spatial tasks and emotions, okay? And your left hemisphere is dedicated to things like verbal tasks, okay? And this kind of gets translated into our everyday speaking. How many of you have heard of somebody referred to as being more right-brained? Okay, so, so that gets into our culture, and we talk about people being more right-brained as people who are more artistic and more creative, okay? And people who are more left-brained are more... Um, you know, mathematically oriented or, you know, interested in logic and that sort of thing. And, you know, it's not, not as cut and dry as that, but, but these um, functions of the brain in the different hemispheres um, has influenced the way that we look at um, different people's behaviors. Okay. So what happens when we disconnect the, the fibers that connect the two hemispheres? Okay, that's called the corpus callosum, and that's the, the fibers through which the brain is able to communicate left side to right 